welcome everyone once again to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, and I have a guest with me today to help talk about uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, campus, Christian campus uh, ministry organizations crew, uh, and that is John Anderson. John, I uh, appreciate you joining me. Yeah, good to be here, John. Thanks and, for having and me. John, you were, uh, you were on staff with crew. For how many years were you on staff? Uh, I was on staff about five years. Um, one stint in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and later in Richmond, Kentucky. And um, there were some rocky points, but there were still still great times. And I saw it overarchingly as the big thing I took away was just be faithful to the Lord, faithful to his word, spread the good news of Christ. And that's what I look back on the experience fondly over. So yeah. five years, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, there were definitely some times that We'll, t- we'll get into today uh, that were a lot tougher for me and I think tough for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, it was a blessed thing. And I had a blessed financial and prayerful support base behind me too, that I just even to this day look back on and think that was amazing. Yeah. So well, that's a blessing. I mean, seeing guys live change similar in some ways, I think to the experience I had at Southeastern where, especially as I first got there, I, had a lot of positive experiences and love class and um, yeah. And then, and watching the organization change has been kind of hard and crew has of course been changing and yep. um, not to go into the deep details. Some people watching this probably remember after the uh, 2019 crew staff convention, um, there was a montage that I put out on this podcast of on just here's what was being said. And it was, it was a social justice, completely dominated uh, event. I watched just about every session and uh, I was only, I could only find one where the gospel was even presented in a kind of watered down form. It, the rest of it was mostly just social justice. And uh, since that time, um, and, and I, I know they were already going that direction before that, but since that time, Uh, there's just been a a number of things that have come up to show a tug of war within the organization. Uh, There was that concerned uh, group of of, uh, students and and staff, well, staff workers, I should say. And um, they put together a document outlining some of the errors and concerns they had about cruise direction that without getting into the weeds, maybe you, you can get into the weeds later if you want, but that was kind of, that was ended and it was that that's not, happening um right now uh crew's leadership has been able to maintain uh the their positions and um and and there was actually a story just came out recently in capstone report they're talking about a a staff clip a, a a meeting with a bunch of staff leaders at high levels and crew and if you watch it um basically you find out that the lenses institute which was one of the main Yep. targets, I guess, of, uh, cons- cons- well, it's the main um, group within crew that conservative theological conservatives were concerned about. It, um, it, it supposedly had shut down in the United States. And there was this tweet that they put out there in, in July of 2021, uh, saying that they, the decision to close lenses um, was independent and apart from crew leadership. And they felt hurt and disappointed. And you know, and kind of like this was in the context of them getting a lot of blowback for, for their neo-Marxist critical race uh, theory, postmodern yeah. uh, training that they were giving people. And yeah. so um, fast forward to now, um, Lens is apparently never really shut down. It was put on pause and it was the leadership of crew that were overseeing all of this. And it's going to now be integrated into uh, having... Uh, looks like more influence than it did before. I mean, it's just incredible to me. The, uh, you know, I don't know if tone deaf is the word or, or what it is, but the leadership of crew, um, and, and of course, there's so many things I'm missing in all this, you know, the whole Josh yeah. McDowell thing and them kind of canceling him, but the bring, you know, in the present, it looks like crew's leadership has emerged kind of victorious here. They've been yeah. able to push a social justice messaging without much in the way of consequence. Yep. Um, they've been able to outmaneuver, uh, efforts from within the organization and, uh, there, that stuff is just going to kind of continue and perhaps in a more covert fashion, but it's still there. 
And so that's, I think, frustrating for a lot of uh, people, donors, especially who have given to crew, hoping that there would be a turnaround here. And there doesn't seem to be. Um, now, that's a mouthful. I know I, we want to hear from you, but what, tell me a little bit about your experience in the organization when it comes to social justice, how you mm-hmm. responded, how you were treated by leaders when you disagreed. Um, and, uh, and if you can shed light on where the organizations that currently, let, you know, please uh, inform us about that as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll give a little insight I, uh, on all that. Um, you know, as a foundation, there were, like I've said, I'll just repeat it. I still had overarchingly a wonderful experience and crew. And there are a lot of solid, sound, faithful, mission minded staff and students involved. And so, I just want to say that from the outset, so that's on record, <laughs> if nothing else, because it's true. Um, and I still have a massive love for the organization and for legitimate people, like actual flesh and blood people that articulate and talked about Christ and the gospel to me so clearly. And that's how I came to know Jesus, like not maybe not only through crew, but it was definitely through pretty, um, I would say sound and, um, like penetrating teaching about the need for sinners to have someone to save them. And that there's only one name under heaven among which my men might be saved. And that's Christ that's Jesus. And so crew is a big part of that. I also got it from a very sound uh, local church at the time um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee college. But so I say that all to say uh, still, I had a great experience, but um, to ignore evil and to not uh, call out, falsehood is irresponsible. Um, it's disobedient to God. And so that's where the social justice component comes in. And, you know, I would say for me, it was something that I hadn't really heard much of till probably like 2017 when I was transitioning from intern time, like year kind of year long commitments to a more full-time staff, a longer commitment role. Uh, even those crew interns, uh, maybe you've talked to one or two before, they really do the same amount of work. Like as a staff member, they're just on a shorter commitment base, basis, like a year at a time. Uh, but for me, it was like, I just started noticing probably when I was first on transitioning onto full-time staff, like it just seemed that every major crew staff conference I would go to and over time, student ones too, there would always be a time, not only that we were basically lectured about racial and ethnic uh, disparities and issues and injustice, things like that, but also almost inevitably, I mean, there was typically a time where we were segregated. Um, it was like, I could almost count on it. Like, okay, here's, yeah, they, the non-whites go to that room and uh, the whites go to this room, I guess one for more encouragement, one for more education we'll say, um, like uh, simply you're lectured about things such as white privilege, um, such as economic disparities. Um, basically, I mean, to be honest, just what you might get at a a corporate seminar, uh, but with some Jesus sprinkled on top. Um, and that is one thing I came to know only through essentially only through beginning to study the scriptures more clearly. And I I suppose I just, I just matured as a believer in my walk with Christ, but also my discernment biblically was, you know, whatever you call it, social justice, justice, whatever the pet term is that we want to use as it is broadly defined in our culture. And as it is broadly defined in the church, that is social justice. It is a counterfeit that is not true right and noble. It's not true righteousness. It's not true justice, but rather it is based on prejudice, assumptions, partiality that is showing favor to one while assuming the worst about another. Essentially, we are taught, I'll say it this way, from pulpit to pew to treat one another differently based on ethnicity. And the justification is typically that we live in a racialized society. Um, And therefore, you know, there are natural uh, inequalities that go with that. And I always thought, oh, as opposed to every society ever. Okay. Like Mm -hmm. every society ever. (laughs) 
has yeah. had those issues. Like, it's so, okay, that you, that's, that's not, not well, just us. What, what so. did you do when, well, how often were the meeting, these meetings segregated off and, and so that white students like, were separate and then, and what did you yeah. do in reaction to that? Yeah. Well, initially it was something that was just like, it was so, it's such an extension of just our culture in general. Like, if that makes sense, like that's just, we are taught often to think in those terms. And so for a while, it was just kind of like, oh, like, this is just, you know, when we talk about race, I, I really, I need to, I, I have to, you know, just sit back and listen, you know, mm-hmm. especially as a white person, like, and it was, and so you, you were it, told it just, this uh, in meetings or, oh yeah. I mean, it's meetings from stages, like, it's just most of the time you're sort of told that like um, lift up black voices, those kind of things. Well, what did the other um, staff think of this when, when they hear this? It, I mean, who, I mean, I'm assuming you're getting this from multiple levels at the national. Yeah. Level, yeah. Local. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, some, I think found it kind of weird, um, but it all was happening. It was happening so fast too. Um, and on a local level, you're not necessarily experiencing it that much. That was another, you know, disconnect. And I think it's just a, sometimes a disconnect that happens in larger culture is like on a local level, the people that I ministered with all this, they were so sound for the most part, like dedicated to the local mission that we have to bring the gospel to students on campus, see them come to know Christ, to bring them into the local church you know, like that. So that was just, that was bread and butter for me. And for so many that were, you know, my people that I really look up to and ministered alongside with that were peers or those that were, you know, a little older than me that were my boss or just a little bit more mature in the faith than I was. Um, so that was something where it wasn't that much experience there. And so it was often with increasing measure experienced at major Uh, conferences like winter conference or like a staff conference, for example, a regional staff conference or the entire big um, staff conference. And so I think there were some people I could get the gist of that. This is, it's really weird. Um, And it it doesn't seem like we are definitely racist a lot of the times, like (laughs) frankly, just, we absolutely trash white people constantly. Um, and we think that's okay, even right. though the Bible says, do not show partiality, even though the Bible says that God hates unequal weights and measures. And we definitely non-debatedly use different weights and measures for how we are to judge one another. Does that, but a lot of times I think, to be honest, like the people that understood or kind of had the sense that this is really weird, like it was hard to articulate it because the language that you're fed by our culture and by broader, even these days, unfortunately, Christian culture, all the terms that you're fed is from a more social justice perspective. And so like, you're like, you don't even have the language to really use a lot of times. Like I had to, maybe, maybe my experience is different than some, but I really had to think and study to realize that oh like the law of god in leviticus says thou shalt not show favor to a rich man or a poor man in a lawsuit like i had to come to realize like oh my gosh if that's true and that's god's standard and it's not that we ignore problems or ignore the poor or anything like that but if that's true if that's god's standard of walking into a situation is that i don't already automatically show you favor or show you you know, disdain or see, or think that I have something over you just by virtue of your social location. Right. If that's what God says is right. Oh my goodness. Then we are so unbelievably wrong. Like that's, and that was when the light bulb went off to me was just continuing to stay in the scriptures and to realize that my goodness, prejudice, prejudging is the entire foundation of what we're calling social justice. And so, you know, like when a news story or something happens and there's a, you know, a a non-white person dies and it's a white cop or something like my response to that tells a lot of whether I'm about what's actually just and right and true and good or not. Mm -hmm. If I'm already presuming 
Like if I'm already presuming, oh, no way, there's no way that cop was racist, then I'm sort of already reading into the situation and I'm not helping things because I'm not doing justice as God would have it. On the other hand, if that happens and I presume classic case of racism, I mean, it's everywhere. I've already done injustice too, because I don't know, like, or if I assume this was definitely premeditated murder, I don't know. And that's the point. Like the point was truth matters. What's actually right matters. Not just forcing people into a system of thinking that isn't true in every situation absolutely matters. And that's part of, you know, the tyranny of it. Um, So it just teaches us to judge each other by those presupposed standards, you know, tell me a little bit about what you did specifically. So, so you, you were in these meetings, you were hearing this social justice language, you disagreed with it. Um, any pushback? I mean, did you try to voice your concern? How was that? <laughs> how was that met when you tried that? Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of varied. Um, and I'm, I don't claim to be perfect in articulating when something needs to change. Did I always go, did I always, do I always go through a proper channel in life? And so I've, you know, think we all stumble in many ways and I've matured hopefully and will continue to mature in that, you know, like, um, but sometimes it was, it depended on the situation and it depended on the person you're talking to. Like, you know, I feel a lot of times if you're just a person to person standpoint, just like a peer, who's not like an upper level, you know, staff person, it's like, you might be listened to and disagreed with a lot of times that's kind of, or heard for a second, but ultimately like, well, that's because you're not about justice. Right. Sort of the, that was the usual, that was the, from up top and just from any channel that was sort of relevant, like, well, if you're not with this, you're not about justice and you're not necessarily anti-racist. And it's like, no, it's actually because I'm pro-justice and not racist and trying to not produce racism that, you know, I oppose this. Um, And over time, I became a little bit more dogmatic with it because it just became more cartoonish, to be honest, over time in terms of the lengths of obvious, frankly, sin and evil that were so right in front of us all. Uh, But sometimes it was that. Sometimes it was, you know, I've given a a chance to talk to someone who's a little bit higher up in the organization. They were admittedly, like, and thankfully gracious to um, to hear me and schedule a time, busy people, of course. Uh, well, okay. So you, that'd be ignored. Like, yeah. So, but you, you did take a change. You did voice your opinion. You did. Yeah. Well, yeah. Know, that you didn't um, agree with this and you caught the ear of yeah. some people. Probably um, annoyed my boss once, once or twice too many times about it. So, uh, and he would, he was gracious to allow me to speak to, you know, someone higher than him and higher than that guy. So how did that end though? Where did you, was there any change? Was there no, any, did they give you the no, ring no. around? Did you get in trouble at all? Did you ever get like suspended or anything? Um, no suspensions. Uh, I have a clean record. Um, <laughs> but it's appended. Like uh, yeah, I, and I think I'm, I think I might be speaking about just how any person in any situation might experience it, but you can be ignored. You can be listened to, but ultimately disagreed with and, ignored you can be just shot down like we're not going to hear you or you can be punished like and you know i had one instance where i pushed back in a way that was sort of a little bit more public and so i did have like a fourfold plan i guess headed up by like crew hr or something along those like people and culture I think that was basically an HR department. I could be wrong, but essentially a fourfold plan to apologize um, for calling out something in a meeting uh, in a way that I called it out. And uh, then to go through a lenses training, uh, which you've talked about, heard about. Wait, lenses. hold on, back up. So this, this whole story though, that you're, you're telling, cause maybe you don't want to give all the details, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. You don't have to, if you don't want to, but um, you were in a meeting and yep. Can you give us at least a, or were you rude? Were you out of line? Were you, was uh, it? I know I, uh, to this day, I, I, in my opinion, I wasn't like, it was, 
I was making light of something that I think was a very disturbingly evil thing. I'll put it that way. That's how I've always seen it. Um, and maybe it wasn't the wisest move. I guess that's the only what was the evil real, thing that was- the evil was. OK, so a few summers ago, um, George Floyd was killed, uh, which was a. And the context of that being pretty interesting, like a lot of people were inside at that point because it was during the heights of COVID mania uh, and COVID response and all of that. And so a lot more people than usual inside, a lot more people watching the news than probably. And so George Floyd uh, became a huge story, him being killed, right? And the it seems based on the evidence that it was at the very least irresponsible of like that cop, um, if not just straight up murder. Right. Right. So if nothing else, anyone who's anyone with the mind of Christ that sees that you at least think, man, like that seemed unnecessary at the very least, like <laughs> to have your knee on him. But nonetheless, like, you know, there's a guy who's been killed and that's fine to mourn over that, you know, like uh, someone who is an image bearer of God, you know, was he perfect? No, he was probably he probably had some stuff going on in his life that he was in sin about, like from what I've heard, but you know, still a sad thing to mourn over that we have to watch this video and it's a national story and that someone was probably just straight up murdered. And so, you know, I, but I knew, okay, our response to this, like if we, if we responded, to this as a ministry, because I don't think every news story warrants a response. I actually think that's wise not to a lot of times, because that means you're not, just basically a slave to cultural winds um, waved around by every wind and doctrine. But I knew that our response to this particular event at this moment in time would tell a lot about our assumptions about God, our assumptions about what is right and Christ-like. And so I think it was just maybe my region of staff, but there was an email invite to all staff and my little region to attend. And I think it was a lenses sponsored, sponsored thing, attend a lenses sponsored zoom call in lament of George Floyd's death and the laments of, I think, systemic racism in America. And those zoom calls would be segregated a zoom call for, to use, I guess the modern term BIPOC, uh, non-white um, staff, right, right. Um, a, a call for them to lament and feel comfortable in their lamenting, I suppose, and a call for white people to lament and be educated on the persisting racism in the land or something along those lines. And the justification, because there was, I think, a little bit of pushback because they sent a response email out like a day or two later saying like the reason, you know, some have asked why these are of separate rooms basically or separate zoom calls. Well, Mm -hmm. we want to mourn with those who mourn. And and we think it's best that we give our staff of color essentially a space to do that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at that point, I just remember thinking, wow, if I could, I can only imagine if the shoe is on the other foot. Mm -hmm. Like if I would expect to be struck by lightning by God and feel that he's totally within his, it would adjust reason to do so. If I said, Oh, this thing that happened in our culture was awful. I just can't be around. Like I just can't be around black people right now. I just, Oh, that would be obviously massively sinful against those brothers and sisters in Christ. Massively sinful, massively partial, massively hatred against them. That mm-hmm. I think that my, what I feel about this trumps my, at the very least, my duty, but also hopefully my heart's desire to love them and be near them just because they look like the person a little bit more who did the, the, the sin than I do. That would be ludicrous. And so to see that happen is just like, not only is this obvious prejudice, partiality, unequal weights and measures, you know, to even a more of a level than what it was like last week, but also like 
the more and more we do this, the more and more I'm, we're just leading people into sin. I'm, we're, both rooms are in sin here. Like the one room is in sin because they're being taught and led to believe that it's totally okay to have that viewpoint toward other brothers and sisters. And it's the same sin for the other one. Like we're taught, we're sinning because we're condoning that even if our motives are good here, like we're condoning that idea that God hates. And so that was, that was just an, an abominable thing to me. I could not believe that what we were doing, like, this is our response. This is our line in the sand here. It's, and this is what we're doing. And so it wasn't like it was just that, like that sort of way of thinking had, I wasn't necessarily surprised by it because I had experienced plenty of things that were of that same mindset um, in practice, like over the past couple years before that. But, you know, I came into the call, the, the whites only, you know, cause I, I guess I qualify for that. And, you know, I, I had a little fun with it. I saw, okay, like we're in a, we're in a call that's designed for a, sp- a specific ethnicity or a race, whatever. And this kind of reminds me of, you know, back in the fifties or sixties, I just, I was just thinking it sort of seems like that, right? Like, I think we might, maybe we'll get separate water fountains one day, maybe separate bathrooms. I don't know. I didn't know at the time. And so like, I just thought I, this is such a massive evil before God. It is such giving the finger to him that I'm going to have a little fun with this because I'm just kind of fed up. And so I, you know, you can change your zoom screen. Like we all like to do, um, you know, I'm not in my office right now. I'm on the beach. You didn't know. Um, no, we, we can change our Zoom screen. And so I've changed mine to like a Jim Crow era looking whites only, let's say bathroom sign or, you know, restaurant sign to make a point that this is who we are now. This is who we are. We were the, we are the anti-racist people and we are in a whites only yeah. Zoom call like this. If you can't see the, if you can't see the cartoonish levels of frankly stupidity here and violating what really loving neighbor is and mourning with those who mourn, because you can't just violate God's commands and say, well, I'm mourning with those who mourn because loving your neighbor, loving God, mourning with those who mourn, whatever, have standards. Right. (laughs) And so we can't say that we're doing this when we're Sataning, like it's, it doesn't work that way. And so it was just something that I was in the call for about a minute. We've got, I don't know, 200 zoom squares, you know, on a screen. And, you know, if you're in a big call, sometimes there's multiple like screens. And so I think I was in the call, like we were just in sort of a waiting room scenario. We're all just like the Brady bunch uh, on screen there saying hi, hey to each other. And so I was kicked out of the call in my, maybe a minute after someone probably who was an administrator was like, what does that say? Oh, we should probably do something. And so I was kicked out silently. Um, and that was, that was that. And I kind of thought like at the time I was like, Oh, a couple of weeks went by and I was like, <laughs> maybe this is just the wild west at this point and nothing's going to happen. And then I got a call from, um, I think it was someone at HR and um, began a process of like discipline for the act, I suppose. And so the actual act itself, I was not proud of like in and of itself. It's not like something I'm like, this was funny. I mean, it's sort of funny in a point, but what was, it was sort of a test. If anything, it was a little bit of a test. Like, okay, if I show up here like this and people are upset about, what are they upset about? Mm -hmm. Like, what are they? Oh, you're white supremacist. Okay. Are, are you the one who's gung-ho about sitting in a whites only Zoom call or am I? Because I'm definitely not. And so no matter like what gets thrown on me of how dare you, it's like, this is not who I'm trying to be. It's meant to be a mirror. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it was meant, there's nothing else. It was just meant to be a mirror. Like, can we please see who we are? And can we please stop pretending that we are living according to what God says? And so, you know, it was, I was given a process of discipline. And so you said you had um, to go to lenses 
as a punishment or, or as a result of that. Um, yeah. What was that like going to the Lenses Institute? Um, you know, by the sovereign hand of God, it never panned out. Um, so oh. I, uh, I, I had to pray and think, and it wasn't just for that reason. It was for multiple reasons. I ended up transitioning to part-time staff um, at the time. And so I think basically maybe they just found it wasn't necessarily worth all this stuff. I, mm-hmm. Lenses was probably at the time going through transitionary phase two. Like it just felt like a lot of stuff was in transition. COVID was still going on. Campuses were still, you know, shutting down ministry from, being really allowed in person. And so I think maybe just the timing of when it happened was like, it got swept, not swept under the rug, but just like lost in the shuffle maybe, or maybe it was just me going on part-time staff. Um, gotcha. Cause I was a lot less, I was a little bit more like one foot in terms of nationally out. Um, so, but I never lost at the same time, like all that being said, I still never lost like the love of the game, so to speak for like local team and local ministry was still blessed and so i'd still look back on that you know facet and think this was this was wonderful so yeah well i mean it's interesting that they the way that they handled that instead of reflecting on themselves and seeing kind of the absurdity of what they're doing they um punished you and 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 the lenses institute was i mean you weren't someone asking to go there you were just a staff worker um, and, and that's, yep. uh, and, and was it at a local university, I'm assuming, or college? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah, and that's local what, campus. and that's what they, which is the heart. That's the heart. That's right. really is the heart of the, the whole thing. So, right. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and then, and of course you're not in crew anymore. You're, you're doing ministry mm-hmm. elsewhere, but what, what are your thoughts? I mean, um, there's been an effort within crew that I don't know really what to say. I mean, it sounds uncharitable to the people in it, I suppose, but a failed effort, it seems like to try to reform the organization. Where do you see the organization at this point? Um, well, because you know, don't donors, there are donors listening. There are yep. people that yep. mm-hmm. probably other staff workers who want encouragement too. Yep. Um, now that you're not, you're not beholden to crew at this point. I mean, what can you tell yep. us about the organization knowing there's good people in there, but where's the leadership at? Where's the direction at? Well, I mean, from what I have seen and, and experienced, um, and I haven't been around or paid as much attention to the last, let's say, six, seven months, what I gather. The big problem with all of it is not that it looks weird or is, is bad PR or whatever. The problem is that sin has been going on for quite a while. That sin is rooted. Really, the, the root of all of it is a low view of God, a lack of a reverence for God, a low mm-hmm. fear of God. And it's not just crew. It's just evangelicalism, I think. And we all can fall into it. Like it's a low fear of God. And it's really this lack of acknowledgement that God is creator. We are creature and we live by his standards. Mm-hmm. Right. And so all that being said, that's why churches experience things like this and organization. Social justice in and of itself is so, you know, attractional, it's the more root cause, but all that to say, I don't think I've ever seen any public instance because these are things that are done in public. And so there's nothing wrong with this, for example, being done in, in public. Um, but I've never seen a public, any sort of repentance of the ideas and the practices, which we employ toward one another as being, this has been a false direction, a sinful direction. Like we really have fallen into worldly way of thinking. Um, and that's the big thing for me. Like, I don't, I don't know the intricacies of the story necessarily as well as you do uh, that you read a little bit earlier, but regardless of what happens with that particular institution lenses, it's not about lenses or about this one staff conference or it's about the foundation of, is this godly? Is this a book or is it not? And it's not. And so unless something is closed down for repentance sake and for Jesus sake, like a real repentance, a godly sorrow, Mm -hmm. that's where I've never seen any, any real evidence. Um, That being said, you know, for those who are still in crew and have had years and years of ministry, or they're just starting out, you know, 
I, I would say it would be foolish to not think with some discernment on whether it's the best move, but still you can be a faithful witness on a college campus, but you might have to be smart about it. Like for me, you know, I, it became a little bit harder because I had to think of more, more than local consequences because we know that sin spreads Mm -hmm. 11 leavens, the whole lump. The Bible says that Jesus repeats it. Right. And so I knew that over time, it's like, whether this ever gets in my time here to a local level, it is already making it to a conference level. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in now, I'm now part of my job is inviting students, you know, to things that I don't have full confidence of what's going to happen. Like, you know, my final kind of final major winter conference was a few years ago, like in terms of full-time staff. And I knew that Jamar Tisby was one of the keynote sort of like guest speakers had at least two or three major, you know, full, all the students, hundreds of students sessions Mm -hmm. speaking. And I knew enough of him to know that, I mean, this guy essentially divides up people by ethnicity and lectures them accordingly and that's his whole his whole deal he is teaching and preaching racism under the banner the very thin banner that's so obvious to see of anti-racism right and and jesus and jesus like it's just sprinkle some jesus on top and it makes everything palatable and so i knew going in like oh my goodness like we've got kids a lot of them probably don't know christ some do know christ and they're just barely developing any sort of theology, any sort of understanding of how to walk, you know, with the Lord um, in the modern world, especially where there's so much confusion. I mean, we are just bringing them in. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, they have no chance. <laughs> it's just like, and some of them, I've talked to a couple of them, not that many, but it's like, you know, they, it took them a little while to be able to come out of that and, and realize like, oh, wow, like this is, this wasn't good. Like it wasn't mm-hmm. instantaneous. And so a couple of them came away with just a weird feeling that they couldn't articulate it. Why? Because those who are teachers don't give them the words and the mm-hmm. ideas to articulate. And that's a failure on people like me or whoever, uh, pastors. And then one, I think, was gung-ho for a little bit with the cause. And then later realized, like, oh, wait, like, this is wrong for me to think that I can treat. In this case, it was white people in this way. Like, or see them in this way in a different light than the Lord sees them or sees me. So, so um, have you seen some fruit then um, coming out of this with, with former staff that are able to see now uh, the errors yeah. that they were told? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit like, and it, so it's, I, I, there's a, there's a couple that come to mind that like at one point when they first heard these sorts of things, like these sorts of things that like the, the fruit of the gospel is justice. And the church has never been about justice. And we need to be about justice, 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 mm-hmm. justice. Well, if you're not really thinking about it, what right minded or like just normal Christian is going to say, Whoa, 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 no, no way. Hold on with this justice thing. What are you about? <laughs> right. Like, why don't I don't want to do justice. And that always used to drive me crazy that that was always a false dichotomy that was thrown at people. It's like, you're either about this, you're not about justice. And right. it's like, <laughs> no, I, sh- I just I have a brain. <laughs> like I can't believe this when it's lies and it's poison. Right. And even when it's true, it's only on accident that in this case, like it was just to say that a white person did this X against a non-white person. Like, but we just imported that worldview onto everything. And so it was just, everything was racist. Every, you know, it's like, and then nothing is, mm-hmm. but there were a couple of guys that I just, I know. And like, you know, I keep in touch with them here and there that just over time um, saw that, Oh, this is, this was weird. And eventually one of them was a lot more like, Oh, this is not only like not a good direction. It's like an evil direction that we're going. And that was, I don't remember what his necessary process was to see that problem. I mean, I know it was the word of God and I know someone told him to yeah. think about it. Other than, other than that, I don't remember, but that was encouraging. And, you know, one thing I do know for a fact is like a lot of people have similar feelings. A, don't know how to voice them. B, somehow 
maybe think it's wrong to voice them. I don't, I've never understood that because I just don't see the Bible giving much warrant to amongst the people of God when there's falsehood, just not confronting it mm-hmm. seems where do we get that? Um, mm-hmm. But there's that. And then I think a third one is like, there's a fair amount of people that see it as something that is off and wrong and violating scripture, but they're just scared. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether that's good or bad that they're scared, you know, can kind of make it's situational. A lot of times, probably it's like, there were probably times I was a coward. There were probably times I was wise for not speaking up, you know, I mean, like the Lord has to give us discernment based on his word and circumstantially, but I definitely got that feeling that a lot of people were just scared to speak out because, well, if you speak out, I mean, you're like a evil racist, bigot Nazi zombie. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's not, yeah. it's like, okay, do I say this or do I just keep going along? Like it's, that's, that was always the fear within my guts a, a little bit was like, man, if I say anything, like I am seen as enemy number one, the cause of justice in the land like well dang i don't want that (laughs) so yeah well what advice would you have for a staff member who is in a position now as you were not up until not too long ago Uh, what would you tell them um i would say well the big one that comes to mind for me is just the reality biblically speaking that we are called to live teach truth in love and so not sacrificing what is the truth, but also realizing that we are to be gracious. We are to care about the person Mm -hmm. or the people that we are seeking to win. Um, Mm -hmm. But that being said, you know, I think it's fairly, I think it's fairly obvious that if we're leaning one way or the other in our day, we're leaning a lot more to not speaking up and to giving, to giving ground. I think, you know, that's just the era that we're in. We don't have a lot of, John MacArthur esques um, mm. that are on the bolder side and willing to stand up a little bit. And so, even if you're not of that type, though, my biggest advice is just in your interactions and your thoughts about God's word as you're in your time with the Lord, whatever, do not give ground to that which is evil. And I think that is something that is really important, meaning. Do not give ground when you are presented an idea that is unbiblical, when you're presented an idea that it's totally okay to say that, well, we need to have, in this case, it's white people, but it could be another thing in the future. Like we should have, we have need to lift up non-white voices. And if you're not one, well, you need to be able to just listen. That to, to go along with that is, is giving ground to foolish thinking. I don't want to give voice to anyone except God, according to his word. Mm -hmm. And those who are, those who teach it clearly, like, and to, to not have that be the first standard is, I mean, we're already losing. We already, we already lost. If our first standard is what ethnicity or gender or whatever is the person, like it's over. Like Mm -hmm. we've already given ground so thinking the Bible is not necessarily good or clear enough to be taught, you know, by a servant of God who has the mind of Christ. Uh, that, that's my big one is even if it's just within as the Lord is teaching you, like, do not give ground to evil ways of thinking because life and teaching, life and doctrine are always connected. There's one does never apart from the other. What you believe and take in will show itself. The mouth speaks. Love, mm-hmm. Jesus says. And so if I start to believe false things about, you know, in this case, it's justice. It could be in the future, something else. Like I will become a tyrant who is disobeying God and enforce that on others. I remember I'll just share kind of maybe one or two other instances of like, wow, I can't believe this, but it was so insightful. And I'll never forget this for the rest of my life in terms of how I think things can go. And just how falsehood works. Like I remember we had this group. It's probably still in existence. It's a Facebook group. It's about culture, cultural competency. And it was a lot, a lot of it was focused on racial justice, basically. And I remember like there was like a white guy and a black guy in this, in one, in a thread. 
like they're little topical threads, kind of like any Facebook group or whatever. And they were talking about just some subject. I don't know if it was justice or it could have been something different than that, even just doctrine or something. And like, Mm -hmm. so white guy, like he says a to the guy over here, guy B. So guy A says something to guy B and they're just kind of, they're not necessarily hating each other. They're just disagreeing basically about something. But I think this, well, actually I think it's more wise to this. And so then a third guy, guy C, he comes in and he is, he has a fairly prominent position in terms of like, he helped plan a lot of the regional conferences, like helps lead summer missions. Like, you know, he's someone who a lot of people know and he has his hands on some important things in the organization and makes decisions on who's going to potentially who might speak, whatever, like programming. And I remember him, like he basically instructs the white guy, guy a something along the lines of that was an okay point, but we need to be careful of white splaining. Hmm. And I remember at that point thinking like, this is, that was so bad to say. And it was, I mean, it really was just, it was classic like partiality, like point A, point B. It's not whether point A was true or false, whether point B, no, it's just you're white, you're black. We need to be careful Mm -hmm. like that. But it taught me that one instance taught me so much about the way that those thought processes processes were like in, in that one instance, that was a small little thing. The guys got over it. It was fine. But like in that moment, it's like, okay, that guy, guy C who has quite a compassionate heart, I'm sure is pretty social justice minded. And in one small instance where the stakes are low, he's murdered truth. He's shut down someone who might've been sharing the truth about God. The other guy could have been wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like he, he might've shut that, that down. He's encouraged someone over here to think that his thoughts should be upheld by ethnicity. He's gotten this guy to believe that, you know, they should be considered at least less. Or if you're telling the truth about something like there is such a thing as white splaining, which is like, how would you define that? The only thing I can think of that being is like, Hey, I'm white and you're not. So deal with it. Like, <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of. You know what I mean? Like white splaining being like, you can't understand because you're not white. Mm. And he wasn't doing that. He was just making a point like trying to find the truth, speak the truth. And I just remember thinking, man, like if this is what the thought process is in a very low stakes thing, being high stakes, like when there's hundreds of students or hundreds of staff, and this is the kind of thinking that dominates and sort of like wins the day. Mm -hmm. Like that was fascinating. Another one, kind of the last one I'll share just in, in terms of it, just crystallizing how far away we were from fear of God. These are kind of, those are the, those are the examples I, that really all come to mind for, for me for the whole time was like maybe two or three years ago, like, you know, there was, there's a Super Bowl, like the, the biggest NFL game of the year, the Super Bowl and Super Bowl always has a Super Bowl halftime show. Um, and it's no shock. It's never a Christian artist. Um <laughs> But this particular Super Bowl halftime show, I want to say it had two prominent, like, uh, Hispanic female artists mm-hmm. um, at it and good voices, everything like that. But, you know, the show, it was more, um, it was more sexually raunchy than even the typical halftime show. Yeah, which you're talking about the Shakira and uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Or now Bance, Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. yeah I didn't see it. Go. I just... I remember so, when it happened. Yeah. Okay. Good. I was gonna say, man, we gotta we gotta have a talk then. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, so I'm sure they have great voices, very talented. But I remember it being an actual thread on the same sort of group that okay, what what should we focus more on? Should we focus more on the fact that you know there was yes there was rampant you know promiscuity and the degrading of someone's body and probably leading others into sin, like, cause you're just flaunting your sexuality. There's, and, and many more things, you know, but 
functionality. And then there's that, but then it's like, what, or should we focus more on the fact that, Hey, I mean, but look, who got to be up there to Hispanic right. women. Right. And I'm just sitting there like you there. Oh, <laughs> how are we missionaries? How are we missionaries organization and even entertaining? This is a subject that's even debatable. Of course, it's more important that there was rampant sexual sexuality. God's not looking down saying, you know, I didn't like this, but Hey, at least they were Hispanic or whatever. Like that is ludicrous to think that, that we have the mind of Christ and that's what we're going with to me was just at the time I was, man, like, and I, and on those types of threads, I remember like, after a while, I felt like maybe I'm just a bit too like I'm too much like Ebenezer Scrooge or something because I usually kind of <laughs> I'm I'm like the sort of meanie on the thread. But like a lot of times when I would like post back on things like that, like there was almost no support. Mm-hmm. Like it, maybe there was some, but it was like it was almost always like I bet you the the disagreement with me is going to be four to one, like at at least. Like, and I, and I get that in that group, it was a certain segment of crew staff that tended to dominate it. Those who are more social justice minded, but regardless, it's like the fact that we are entertaining this and not seeing that this is a sinful way of thinking that contradicts scripture, that we should not be celebrating the fact that two people are up on stage doing that or also have to be of some ethnicity and that those things are even close to 50, 50, which they're not was very um it was just troubling uh to well, me. yeah and, the, and both of these stories taking place within the context of crew um and missionaries it, missionaries and it's a <laughs> you know conservative evangelical organization is supposed to be should really give everyone a little bit of pause um <laughs> yep so but i hey look i appreciate you coming on and sharing all that because i know you know i've had contacts from a lot of different crew missionaries especially um, in probably to, to 2020, I had a lot of people reaching out when there was an effort underway to try to reform crew. And, um, you know, the vast majority aren't willing to come and share. And you are willing to come and share about some of the experiences you had. So I appreciate that. Um, anywhere you want people to, uh, to go to find out more about what you're doing, you have a website or anything like um, that? Yeah, I don't have any sort of personal uh, website. I do... Uh my church, my local church here, um, which has been a blessing for me in the four years or so that I've lived in my current town in Kentucky. Um, we have a few things that we uh, do. A couple of them are we're seeking to build um, local church, church resources, uh, particularly for um, just in many ways, your average uh, person in the pews. Mm-hmm. Um, and so two main age groups. The first one is probably those who are, you know, 10 and above or something called theology for you. And that is simply looking at some of the great teachings, the most important teachings of scripture, and maybe later on other ones um, and allowing it to be a 10 minute or so video that teaches on uh, like the topic of the clarity of scripture or justification or the authority of scripture, um, those sorts of things. Um, Mm. and doing that in a format that could be used in a local church, um, as a, you know, help for a local church, if they're looking to, um, like a Wednesday night, uh, series or something, they use this sort of as a launching point to talk more about the authority of scripture or, or even for just family learning, something like that. Uh, the second one is kids of grace, uh, kids of grace is designed probably for kids, um, eight and below or so. And it's the same ideas same core realities of who is God, what is true about us as people and what must be done about it. Essentially God is creator. He is the authority. He's created us to know him, to serve him, but our natural bent is to rebel against that and to not love him and to worship other things. But there's hope in Jesus, the one who lived a perfect life in our sake died Mm -hmm. for us and offers us true hope and new life. But doing that in a way that is more tailored toward kids with a bit of, you know, um, a bit of fun, I guess you could say, or silliness from the hosts. Um, but I think it's age appropriate, um, to be 
And so that, and probably just our church church website, if, if people are in the Lexington-ish area of Kentucky and are looking for a church, um, yeah. that's, that's why I'm providing uh, that is that, you know, no church is perfect, but I do like to think that, well, one, we're a true church because we have the truth of Christ. We have a true gospel and hold to a true gospel. Uh, we're not adding things or subtracting. We believe in Christ and his death and resurrection um, as real. Um, but two, I think we, um, we're a solid church in other areas too um, that will be helpful in an era of confusion um, and compromise. Well, thank you. I'll put the links in the info section for anyone interested in that. Yeah, uh, you're to be commended, John, for uh, being vocal about this and taking a standing crew. And uh, appreciate yep. you coming on and sharing. Appreciate it, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really yeah. do appreciate God it. God bless, brother. Thanks. You too.